My name is Carlito Banjok, and if you want to send me an email, my email is msbboc at yahoo.com. I'm available to answer any questions. Uh, it's at bagio.net. Uh, started my martial arts training when I was about uh, 10 years old uh, here in Stockton, California. I was born and raised in the Philippines, but I did practically most of my training here. Um, when I was younger in the Philippines, I tried to get my father to teach me, uh, but at that time, uh, he just felt that I wasn't ready. And we came here in 1971. And when we came here, he just wanted me to concentrate on school, you know, and he just didn't want me learning martial arts yet. He felt that uh, my temperament wasn't ready yet, I, wasn't, I didn't have the maturity. But then, after coming here, I was being picked on all the time. And actually, my sister is the one that begged my father to teach me. I think it wasn't so much that I'm gonna learn how to defend myself or, you know, learn how to fight, but it was to build my confidence, really. It depends where, what footwork I use, what footwork he's using, how he's attacking me, how he evades. Stan uh, had me train with Roy Unor in Stockton, California. Manon Roy was from the island of uh, Bohol, and uh, his system was called the Talawan system. Talawan in Bisaya means coward, because they didn't like to stand still. They were called cowards. You know, stand and fight, coward. You know, and then so so he kind of stuck. You know, Talawan, and uh, he had a running style because he's designed for multiple opponents. My Nong Roy was very an effective instructor. My father didn't have the patience, and not only that, he didn't have a systematic way of teaching. Uh, it's just because when he was younger, when he started studying the system uh, that was in the family, he wanted to learn how to fight so he can bet money and fight, uh, bare knuckle. He just wanted certain techniques to help him. He didn't study the whole system. And then so that's why we call it Cadiz Lapo Lapo. Cadiz is where my great grandfather settled in, uh, in Negros Occidental. We don't use the Lapo Lapo name by itself because there's another Lapo Lapo school there. And my father felt that the, the Lapo Lapo group in the in Negros uh, was more of a complete style, and he didn't want to dishonor them. But the drills that he learned from the family system, the Lapo Lapo system, um, is what he used for his technique when it came to grappling and, and boxing and so forth. So I continued to study with Manon Roy until Manon Roy passed away, and that was in the mid '70s when he passed away. Uh, my father was hoping that uh, somewhere down the road I'm going to get to study with John LaCosta, you know, and uh, in Stockton, but then he passed away because um, he was killed and he was murdered. And then, so my father belonged to uh, the Gohe Lodge in Stockton, and then, uh, so we heard of the many screamers there, and uh, so, but we were new in Stockton, so I was kind of like lost looking, looking for an instructor, and I met Manong Angel. I watched their class. And it was different because they stood at one place and they worked their hands a lot, you know, and my hands are, are active, I can't fidgety, I can't stand still, you know, I want to do things with my hands and so I really liked it, you know, and it was something, it was a taste that I didn't have. All the movements were compact and fast and so I have to have my father's permission, you know, it's just a Filipino thing and he's my teacher. And then so, Finally, he said, okay, I'll go meet him. So they hit it off, and so my dad said, go ahead and start taking his cream up. I started teaching for Mono Angel. You became an assistant in his class right away after you graduate. Uh, that was in 1983. But then, after that, Mono Angel, because I had to test with him, uh, because in the class, you're training with Mono Angel, but not directly. You have several instructors there that are helping you. Then he would come and correct you. And, and so, but true one-on-one -on -one training, I didn't get with Manong Angel. And then so when I was testing for my graduation, you know, they, I was good enough to graduate, but I was still lacking. You know, there were th things missing. And then so he just, you know, told me to, uh, to come and train at his house. And so I would come down at 11.30, we would have lunch first. He's my teacher, he's cooking for me, right? And then he sits me down in the dining room table and he says, hey, next time you come, you have to bring me this, my, you, you bring coconut. I said, 
coconut mano? And he said, no, coconut. I didn't know what he meant by that, you know? And he's got a heavy Filipino accent. And he brings out a bottle of Hennessy, you know? So, hey, you know, that's my sacrifice, right? So every, few, every now and then I would bring him cognac, not all the time. And uh, so, and then I'd bring him other things. Uh, and, and of course, you know, pay him money to, for me to be there. So I moved to the outside. Okay, so imagine me going on. The legs were weak because I, I didn't mention this. Uh, I was born with uh, spina bifida. And so I have uh, paralysis to my lower extremities, you know. And so at that time I could walk, but I walked with a limp. My left leg was paralyzed and I had a deformity on my right foot, my ankle. I would actually push off on my heel. And so I had like a twisting. You know, when I walk with my right heel, I push off my heel because I couldn't push off the ball of my foot. So we start working out, and I couldn't even step out with my left foot for the basic outside block in Serrata. I had to stay right foot lead. So when I did an outside block, I did it right foot lead. And uh, so uh, everything was my weapon forward. And so it made me really good with my check hand. And I didn't know this, man, but we would do three shots before, two or three shots before we started working out. So in the beginning, I was off balance and drunk. And when you're young and you're not used to drinking, you know, two shots, that's a lot. But after a while, I got used to it. And uh, Suwada has this uh, footwork. He's like a tapping footwork. And he's got a beat like with the foot. You're switching your feet and you're tapping. That's your timing. I couldn't do that. Okay? And, and no matter how much they tried to teach me, I just couldn't do it. But Manong Angel has me standing on right foot lean only. And I'm blocking everything and maneuvering and my parrying got real good, you know, and I just twist my body and to get out of it, learn how to lean a certain way so I don't get hit. Next thing you know, all of a sudden my feet started tapping. Next thing you know, I'm switching my feet. It's like, oh my gosh, I learned the footwork without moving. And that was it, it's just, there it is. That's what I wanted you to do. And then so, he gave me the ability to move it with balance. He gave that to me. Years later, I started having problems with my right foot. I had this blister that we thought was healed, but it wasn't healed. And, it, and I, next thing you know, I had an infection. And we were trying different things to try to correct this. It got worse and worse. 87, 88, they already told me that um, they're going to probably, the, the, there's, an op, there's a possibility that they're going to amputate my leg. So I'm thinking, man, they're going to amputate my leg. How am I going to do this? How am I going to continue to do what I love? And then so with tears in my eyes, man, I went to my instructor. And, and I, I told Manong Angel, I said, Manong, they're gonna probably have to take my leg. Um, what am I gonna do? How am I gonna participate? So I said, okay, I'll just, I'll teach you how to teach. So he taught me how to break down his system. And, you know, he told me, showed me step by step how to do it. So then he said, now you can teach sitting down. You don't have to move to teach because you can direct the footwork. And then so I would do that in his class. I started teaching the new students there. He passed away actually before they have been in my leg. Manong Angel passed away in 1991, March 3. I can't forget that because of my birthday. Now my father, when he showed me the double stick drills, and then so he, he, so he showed me something I could understand. So I would show him Mano Angel's technique and he would show a different interpretation. Uh, so that's how we were able to complete that because he had a different insight of, of, of the technique. My, when I say, when I teach the Kadis Lapu Lapu system, uh, it's based on the double stick, but he has a lot of Serrata flavor. I can't get away from that because I trained with Serrata for so many years. And now my Serrata has the Lapu Lapu flavor you know, because I do, I practice that all the time. I can, I, I teach them separate, you know, but there's got to be a point that you become one and you just, the blend is so natural. And then one last, the Talawan system. Uh, so I teach that last because I need an assistant to teach that one because I can't play with you. It's a multiple opponent style.
so you have to run, you have to move. Yeah, so we gave the school Mata Sabagyo that name in, I believe, 1989. Mata Sabagyo in Visaya it means uh, eye of the storm. If you have the storm, the center of the eye is calm, calm presence of mind in battle. And the outside of the storm, that's where the damage is being done. You know, so while you're fighting and you're using your, your weapons, you have to have a calm presence of mind. <laughs> If you look at most styles, you know, they, 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 you can tell similarities, you know, movement. The body can only really move, move so many ways, you know, so I guess when you say unique, I guess it's our openness to learn, you know, we just don't want to limit ourselves, you know, we want to continue to grow. And, you know, so I have different instructors that graduated from me. Each one of them have a different, unique, they're unique as an individual, of course, but because of one guy might be taller, I train him differently. You know, one guy's more wiry, so he's going to be trained to move. Our, our, we have our basic curriculum, but that's just a guide. You have to remember each individual's personality, you know, and because, man, you can't, you can't, you can't just stifle somebody. You can't just restrict them, you know. You got to let them explore, you know, and with proper guidance, you know, they're going to be awesome. My goal is to have my student way better than me. You know, they, they, they should expand their knowledge. You know, they should be better than the teacher. I want, that's what the goal. You know, because I want them to have the passion. When they have the passion for that, then they're, of course they're going to grow and they're going to expand. If, if anyone really wants to know the true influence of what we do, he has to study, they have to study with the different students that I have because they all know different things. Not one person know one thing. This one's here. Where's the hit? Martial arts. They're all combative. You know, it's a warrior art, man. You know, and, and so whether it's Chinese influence, Filipino, Japanese, European, you know, and, you know, there's just a time when you have to protect your family, you have to protect your, your village, you have to protect your country, you have to learn, you know, the art of war. To, in order to protect yourself, you have to sometimes hurt somebody. And you want to be effective at it. One thing about the Filipino martial arts though, man, is that because we train with the weapon first, we train with the weapon in mind, you know, and not only that, bladed weapon. That's already a different mindset. You know, I don't know if that's better or not, but it's definitely a different mindset. When you have a combative art that's involved weapon, man, the extra care for training, you know, is so repetitious and you have to be precise in your movement, you know, because you're training with blade, you know, so you, you can, if somebody punch you or kick you and you get hit, you know, you might not get knocked out right away. You can survive that. But if somebody cuts you, you're leaking. You don't have that much time, you know, and if you're hit in the right place, you're gonna leak faster, you know? And if you're hit in the most precise place, you won't have time to leak. You're already out, okay? And then so your technique has to be precise and the care of the training, it's just sometimes it's too much for, for people. And it's rare that you find somebody that finishes it. Like for instance, uh, awesome style, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, you know, and, and, and the grappling styles from Japan, the grappling styles that started out of Europe. They have a place to showcase that with the UFC and other uh, MMA uh, sports. If you want, if you want to show that you're the best in grappling, you grapple with somebody, and then somebody gets on board or something or choked out, and then you can fight the next day. And they can show that because they can show it safely. And you can show a Filipino martial arts tournament with padded gears, with padded sticks, you know. But nobody understands why there's hitting, it's beating each other up with those foam, foam sticks. And it's hard to show that bladed concept, man, in real. But, you know, if I'm going to grab a blade and you're going to grab a blade, someone's not coming home. This modern time, you know, you go to prison for challenging people. He lost again? Ooh, I just look at his head. I see a lot of positive things that are happening with the Filipino martial arts. But with the Filipino martial arts, we were divided by island. Then you have Ilocano here, you have Tagalog here, you know, you have Pampanga here, you got, you know, 
Visaya, and so you're separated by by your tribe, man. And so, you know, they always wanted to just keep something. You know, they keep this a secret from you. You're you're not one of us. We want to keep this from you. But now, you know, there's more. I see this more. You know, the martial arts coming together. We're getting to going to the mainstream now, getting more exposure. We have some awesome instructors in the Filipino martial arts that I've met over the years. I have no doubt that we're going to grow. You have the ones that are going to continue to move forward and going to bring that they're the ones that's going to be uh, moving this art forward because they just do it anyway because it's the right thing to do. All right, play. <laughs> Man, martial arts has been great for me. Yeah, I learned so much from martial arts. And, and the people I met, my students, and, and uh, you know, it's just, you know, when I'm studying this in the beginning, you know, uh, part of it was to learn how to fight, okay? And then it became fun, you know, and, and as the older I get now, the more responsibility, because we have to uh, continue to grow, we have to continue to bring in new students and expand to the future. And so, so my attitude really changed, you know, I, 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 I like the part of uniting the different arts and, and, and teaching our students to expand their mind, you know, and not to limit themselves. And, but to be proud of the Filipino martial arts. If they're Filipino, then they should be proud of that culture. And if they're not Filipino and they can learn from us, then you know, they should be proud that it's available for them to learn that. Uh, and there's a lot of schools that we can learn from, the ones in the mainstream already. They, they know how to develop young kids to get that discipline. We need to learn how to do that. I see now some schools that have able to incorporate the Filipino martial arts into their curriculum and do it safely and do it with the kids can learn to grow from it. In order for us to grow, we need to be able to teach it more friendly to younger kids so that they can grow over time. And then when they get to that point of discipline, then you can train them as hard as you want. And you have to see the person's personality, you know. And you, you have to look at your students. Um, at what You have to know, am I giving them too much information for them um, you, you, sometimes you do too much and it scares them away. You know, when they're new, man, everything's intimidating. You have to understand that as an instructor. A good instructor understands that. But, you know, I mean, you know, with all due respect, because, you know, there are instructors that's only looking for top fighters. And, and, and that's okay. You know, there's, there's a place for that. You know, but, man, you know, it's just my gosh, man. If, if, if I didn't have a royal lore, that had patience or an uh, angel Kabbalist that had patience to develop me and because I had my physical challenge, you know, and they had the patience to develop me, where would I be in the Filipino martial arts? Or well, in the martial arts. So I'm glad we had instructors that were willing to take their time and help develop us, you know, and, and, and so let them find their, their, their motivation. They have they know what they want. See where you your your you know where your art can help in that area and nurture that. If you're my student, that means I like you, and, and, and you're gonna be a good person. You're gonna be a you're gonna be a good a guardian of our culture, and, and, and so that's 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 what I pray for.